Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober podcast. I really appreciate you coming back. Please hit the subscribe button and like button and all that good stuff because it really helps this channel out. Um, if you want to look at some of our merch, please go to my website, rafa.la slash shop, and you'll see some of our cool stuff that we have there available for you. I want to thank our sponsor, Movita Juice Bar. Go to movitajuicebar.com and you will find all of their locations. You can also order through their food apps. Movita Juice Bar has been with us since day one. I love them so much and they're great supporters of our podcast. But I want to announce also another sponsor that's coming on. And this is the first week that we bring in Picaresca Coffee Shop in Boyle Heights. Picaresca will be our new sponsor. So we're going to have two sponsors now. If you're in Boyle Heights, look up Picaresca Cafe. This is their Instagram right here below. And yeah, I'll be telling you more about them as we continue with this podcast. Big shout out to our studio here, Outer Circle Media. Go to OuterCircleMedia.com to find out more about this company. And if you want to run a podcast, this is the place to do it. With no further to do, today's guest is a producer for television and radio. She's a comedian, a semi-serious journalist. Ladies and gentlemen, Marisol Medina Cadena. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Dancing Sober podcast. Today we have Marisol Medina Cadena, who um, sometimes calls herself a radio reporter, podcast producer, documentary filmmaker, comedian, and semi-serious journalist. <laughs> you just read my Twitter bio. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah, I said sometimes calls yourself. This is, I mean... I didn't write any of this. This is all stolen from the internet. Yeah. But no, tell me good. about why semi-serious. I actually was, it was, I was playing on a comedian. Someone had in their bio uh, this phrase that's actually used in journalism called like hard, hard, hard journalism. Cause there's like soft journalism, which is mm. like arts and culture. And then there's like hard journalism, which is like breaking news, investigation, data. And so like this comedian dubbed herself like comedian slash hard journalist. And I was like, ha, that's funny. And I was like, well, I don't want to plagiarize you. And the name of the show that I produce is called Right Now Ish. Mm. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm a serious ish journalist. Well, Slash so, comedian. Right now ish, as in things that kind of happened recently. Yeah. So not always like the new news, but. Yeah. Okay. Like in the atmosphere. I dig it. <clears throat> Can you show us a little bit of your radio voice? That's hard. <laughs> kidding, My partner kidding, always makes fun of me for that. Why? It's it's fine. I actually like it. It's it's. I mean, it sounds like it's supposed to sound right. So. Well, I think people don't realize that the way, the why, why people sound the way they do is because when they're recording their scripts, they're not recording it in front of a person. Mm. They're often in their closet, under a towel, on their bed <laughs> to create soundproof. And like they're talking to themselves. And obviously when you talk to yourself, you don't sound natural. Mm -hmm. Like it's a version of yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like an SNL skit. Yeah. <laughs> Well, let's go back to, because um, you're from L.A., but you work in the Bay Area now. But let's go back to, like, where you grew up. Mm -hmm. So I was technically born in Covina, which is still San Gabriel Valley. Mm. But we, I lived in my great-grandma's house in Azusa for a year. And it was my parents, my brother, and me, and there wasn't enough space for all four of us. So my parents went to a party in Pasadena. They'd never been to Pasadena before. And when they left the party, apparently there was like a for sale sign. Mm. And my parents were kind of on the market because they just had a baby and they needed more space. And they like were like, let's come back to this place. Um, and like a year later, they got a house 
um but the house is like pasadena a, yes oh. it was definitely like the eyesore of the block that's funny it was like just very it kind of looked like a haunted house yeah. and so when they bought it I couldn't live with them right away because there was like lead in the house mm. so like I had to stay with my grandma mm. in Covina for like a couple months until like it was baby proof mm. and so like my parents have been in that house for like 27 years now mm. and like I really the best way I can describe it is like sweat equity like every 10 eight years they take out a huge loan mm. to like redo something that's like decrepit <laughs> <laughs> so i feel like whenever my childhood friend i'm sorry my college friends come over they like see this amazing house and they're like wow you like grew up in this house and i was like i mean yeah but no because not the like, way it looks now yeah. right like it was <laughs> not nice like this like you're seeing it now with my parents not having two of, kids in their house to yeah. worry about, you know, my, my parents having a little bit more money than they did yeah. when I was coming up and a little bit more time to actually like do the projects themselves instead of paying someone. Right. So it's kind of this weird, like it is my house, but it is more like my parents' house now. Hmm. And um, where'd you go to high school? So, okay, that's a story in itself. Um, I went to a Catholic middle school and it was like the culture like, oh, you're going to stay at a Catholic school even if you're not Catholic because a lot of kids in our mm. middle school were not actually Catholic. It was just like the cheaper private school. Private school. Mm. And um, so I felt pressured to apply to all these Catholic schools in Pasadena knowing that I didn't want to actually go to any of them because mm. they weren't like kids like who grew up like me, like they just didn't have the same kind of lifestyle or culture mm. or values. And so I was like, mom, I, I did art classes at the Armory Art Center. Oh, that's nice. And our teacher told us about this new high school, affectionately called number nine at the time because they didn't have a name. And the teacher was like, you should consider it. And I told my mom and I was like, mom, can I go here? Can I go here? It's like an art <coughs> public school in downtown LA. like. I, I think this is gonna oh, be good for there? me. And my mom was like, okay, like we'll consider it. And then when push came to shove, she didn't let me go because mm. the first year they weren't fully accredited. Mm. So they told us that if I wanted to go to a Cal State or a UC, I'd have to do night school mm. or like summer school or community college to make up the credits since wow. they weren't fully accredited. And my mom was like, that sounds like a lot of work. Like, I don't trust you as a teenage kid to actually like do all of that. Mm -hmm. So she was like, I'm really sorry. Like, I'm not gonna let you go there. And I was pissed. Mm -hmm. So I was like, anyway. So my mom <laughs> gave me, my mom gave me like two options. She's like, okay, I don't want you to go to LaSalle, which is where my brother went. It's mm -hmm. like this preppy Catholic school in Pasadena. It's technically not Pasadena, it's San Marino. Mm -hmm. My mom's like, I really don't want you to go there. I want you to go to an all girls school. Mm -hmm. So the options were the, I think it was Link, the Lincoln Heights Sacred Heart, mm -hmm. and then Alverno in Pasadena, San Marino, and then Immaculate Heart in Hollywood. And at the time I was kind of like, what's an all girls school? Like I never heard of it. Cause on TV, when you saw girls in uniforms or private school, like Princess Diaries, it was like co-ed. So I was like, okay, I'll go to like a school and be P Mia Thermopolis. Like that was my <laughs> fantasy. I love it. And then like me and my friend That's group hilarious. were like deciding, you know, and my two best friends who were white girls were like, we're going to Mayfield. And my mom's like, out of your goddamn mind and I'm sending you there. That's like way too expensive for us. Mm. So she was like, I'm sorry. And then I was like, fine, I'll go to Immaculate Heart because they have an improv team. Mm. And she, my mom's like, I don't know what the fuck that is, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so sure enough, we had like orientation, right? Like a week before school started. Mm. And like I raised my hand and I was like, hi, I was told you have improv here and that's the only reason why I'm here. How do I sign up? That's hilarious. And the rest is history. 
So you, you, it was, they did have it. Yeah, they did. Okay. But they didn't advertise so it because it was like the lesbians of the school were in it. Mm. So it wasn't like something they were proud about. That's funny. Yeah. That's crazy. When did you like first get this bug for performing or arts? Well, I mean, like I grew up, I always say like my daycare was self-help graphics mm. and Plaza de la Raza because it's true. Like, mm my good friend honestly he's basically a cousin um his dad was the director of self-help graphics mm -hmm. in the early 2000s when it was on cesar chavez mm -hmm. so like me and his kid were just like running around all the time like up to no good <laughs> and he had to keep us distracted because mm -hmm. we would just like interrupt artists all the time mm. um that's funny and then when who was he, the person running it Tomas Benitez. Oh, Tomas. So his nephew. His son. His son. Oh. Was like basically like my cousin. That's cool. Um, Cause his mom and my mom were best, our best friends. Mm -hmm. um, and then when he no longer worked at Self Help, we started going to Plaza de la Raza. So I did tap there. I did painting. I did, did the you do cap the summer arts. Cap oh, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, actually, no, I didn't. I was very jealous of everyone who did. I did the fall cap program. Oh, okay. So I did modern dance because I okay. was a serious kid. <laughs> <laughs> but that's where you started with all the art stuff yeah. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And so now you do do stand up like at clubs or are you just at bars? Do you want to pursue it seriously or is this yeah. just something you Like, I don't want to make money off of it because then it won't be fun anymore but I want to do it because I feel like I'm going to go crazy if I don't. Okay. So does that make sense? Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> I think every artist knows that feeling. Yeah. Yeah. So right now you're just hitting bars and doing five minute open sets. Mics. Or open yeah. mics. Yeah. Five minute sets. Um, and I feel like I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I feel like I have a good sense of reality because my friends and my family don't find me funny <laughs> so it makes me try harder until i can get them to laugh that's cool so then when i go to bars like i am not i'm not like sensitive yeah, if yeah. like the crowd isn't rocking with me because yeah. i'm like oh it's a you problem not a me problem i'm great there's always that one person that doesn't laugh that comedians always focus on I don't yes know, yeah. <clears throat> it's always like this one guy in the front row was not laughing and i i you know gotta make that person laugh yeah. that's not laughing and in my experience because i've done enough i've done like six shows now and i know that i'm good because people like the host of the night will ask me to come back mm -hmm. and that is like um what do you call it when other people see you as a threat mm -hmm. so like comedians won't say hi to me after the show because they see me as like competition. And I'm like, dude, you're trying to do this for a living. I'm not, I'm just trying to blow off steam after work. Yeah, it's like therapy. Yeah, yeah. but like you just have something in your chonies now. <laughs> so do you still do like improv stuff too? Or No, I want to, but- um, I know that you were with the group for a while, right? An improv group? Well, so in San Francisco, there's an improv group called Untold Improv, which mm. is just for people of color. Mm. And it was started by two Asian American mm. people from the Bay. And I joined through a f one of my friends, Lolly. She's like amazing. She's from, where's Prince from? Minnesota. Minnesota. Mm -hmm. She's from Minnesota and she was my roommate. Mm. And she was like going to this, we lived in Oakland at the time. And she was going to the city like once a week for improv. And I was mm. like, Lolly doesn't go to San Francisco. So this <laughs> must be good. <laughs> and she was like, it's amazing. You need to do it. And so finally I did it. And I was like, oh my God, like yeah. I'm addicted. And we were, I was basically doing it all the way up to the pandemic until mm. like the shelter in place order got put in the books. And so since then you haven't done anything? No. No okay. improv. Cause, Cause we don't have like, we had theater space in the Tenderloin mm. once a week. Okay. And we don't have that. And we're all coming from like San Jose, mm. Silicon Valley, Oakland, Marin. So like 
San Francisco was kind of like the meeting point for us. Perfect. So that's all like your fun stuff that you love to do, the improv, the comedy, the trying to make those motherfuckers that don't laugh, laugh. (laughs) (laughs) But like on the serious side, you've been, you know, actually, you know, building a career working with um, NPR and the stations that are connected to it. So KQED and other stations. But how did you, um, we didn't even get to that point, but how did you end up leaving LA to, to go to the Bay Area? Was it for work mm. or? And are you happy there? <laughs> That's a so, big question, but no. <laughs> without naming names, I was very lucky and at the age of like 23, Mm. I had my dream job in LA. Mm. And a year into it, I realized it wasn't my dream job anymore. Mm. And that was really hard for me to come to terms with Mm. because I had like put everything into this job. And mind you, this was my first like job out of college so like I went to school in a bubble I'll I'll be very frank I Mm. went to UC Santa Cruz and I saw the world a certain way Mm -hmm. like you know I didn't just have Latino friends at Santa Cruz (coughs) I had Asian Samoan Mm. black um, Jewish Korean everybody Mm. under the sun Mm. and in our little bubble we all like treated each other with respect Mm. and then I came back to LA and it was very segregated Mm. it was like Latinos only talk to Latinos Asians only talk to Asians black folks only talk to black folks Mm. we don't even talk about Native American folks or Arab folks Mm. even though they exist Mm. and it was really like culture shock for me and I felt like I had to wear a mask at work. Like I had to put my politics aside. Mm. And it got to a point where I was like, I'm f- living a lie. Were you working for a person or for like a company? I mean, you don't have to say a the media name. company. Oh, okay. <clears throat> and that's crazy. Yeah. And my best friend from college is from San Francisco. Mm. And she knew how I was having a really hard time. Mm. And she was like, why don't you apply to this like radio program here? Like maybe you just need like a mentor. Mm. And I was like, you're right. Like I don't really have a mentor. And so I was like, fuck it. I'll apply to this radio thing. And I was kind of doing this like oral history project on the side, so I just used that to apply because I had never done any radio or Mm. audio except for that oral history project. And then they accepted me and I was like, cool. And then the lady was like, okay, like you have like four days to tell us yes or no. And I was like, oh shit. I mean, but I don't live in the Bay, like, that's a lot for me to decide if I'm so going to quit my job. job. You liked it, but you had to tell them in four days if you're going to yeah. <laughs> go move to the Bay Area. And so I And would, you were like 21? No, I was 24. <clears throat> 24, okay. Oh, yeah, I was after college. Yeah. yeah. And I told my dad, and he was like, you're crazy. You have a good job. Like, it's really hard to get a job. Like, don't drop your job yeah. and my mom was like you should do it because she is from the bay so she's like the bay is great my best friends were like you should do it you hate your job hmm. uh my brother was kind of indifferent i couldn't tell my co-workers because i didn't want to like yeah stir anything if, yeah in case you stayed yeah yeah so i was just kind of like i just kind of took a gamble like 50 50 And I accepted it because the lady, or I found out that the program was really competitive, like Mm. 200 people applied and only like eight people get in every year. Mm. So I was like, damn, I guess I should do it. (laughs) So I like put in a month's notice. I gave my job a month Mm. and they were shocked. They were like, what? Like we were going to put you on all these projects and like, 
like renew your contract and all blah 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 and I was like sorry like I I have this gig in San Francisco I, my pa- my dad was pissed mm. my family from LA was just like you can't leave like no and I went to go live with my brother for like to get settled and the program I did mind you was unpaid mm. it was like a fellowship where you train two days a week. So you have to have a job. Mm-hmm. And I worked at a public high school in San Francisco and I had a weekend job. So I was like working two jobs and a fellowship to like pay my rent and bills. Just to be a part of this thing. Yeah, <clears throat> cause I was just like, I'm so miserable Yeah. in LA right now. So it must've been horrible. I mean, if that pushed you, like who cares, you know? And also you're, very young where you can do these things and you know recover in a lot of ways so don't even trip i always say that a job is just a job it's not doesn't define you you know forever you can always just and at 50 i can totally tell you that you have a lot of room to even make other like career shifts if you ever need to but so now you're up in the bay area you're working for the two Mm -hmm. jobs and that and you just decided to stay? Like, well, what kind of jobs were you doing for them? I mean, it's weird. Like, I kept telling myself, this is temporary. Like, mm. I'm only going to be in the Bay for two years, and mm. then I'm going to go back to L.A. Mm-hmm. Because the Bay Area is crazy expensive. Mm-hmm. And I just kept getting jobs. And it's not like they were great jobs, but mm. it was a job doing what I wanted to do. Mm. So I kept staying. And I d- kept applying to stuff down here, but I never got it. And I, someone told me, like, in journalism, the way it goes is you have to leave your home in order to someone from your home to want to hire you back. Mm. And that was kind of like, a eye opener to me and I was like okay well if I have to leave LA to be to come back one day then I'll stay in the bay but I'm never going to leave California cuz a lot of like in journalism the phrase is like go where the job is mm-hmm. so say you're four generations californian it's kind of expected you're going to uproot your life and go live in but fuck somewhere like for 4 years mm-hmm no offense to those places but it's like i don't know anyone there and so many of my colleagues that i came up with who were my age Hmm. did that i have a friend who moved to alaska wow i have a friend who moved to connecticut Hmm. and these are like people from california who like want to work in california and work in their communities but they're not hiring they see the kind of work that you can do in somebody else's community. Mm. It's kind of fucked up, Mm -hmm. but that's the nature of the game. Mm. I'm trying to follow um, your story here. What you were doing for this fellowship was like... Radio. Radio, right? Radio journalism. And then you got hired by... And KQED. Yeah, so... The fellowship was through a smaller NPR station, like Mm. very scrappy, Mm. shoestring budget, Mm -hmm. KLW. Then I later applied, when I finished that fellowship, I applied to a paid internship at KQED, which is like the fancier NPR with resources. Nice. (laughs) And it was a year paid internship. I was still freelancing, still hustling the other four days of the week until they finally hired me full time. I know that at one point you had a piece at VPAM that I saw. So when when was that and how does that fit into this whole history? And how did you end up in a museum? So I was already living in the Bay. That was my first Mm. year in the Bay. Mm. And um, it's so funny. I always wanted to work for BPAM. Before mm. I did journalism, I wanted to be a curator. Mm. Um, that was my senior thesis at UC Santa Cruz, was tracing my family's involvement with the Magonistas, mm. the, anarch- the Mexican anarchists. Mm. 
and I spent a year making that 15 minute film to graduate uh, with a degree in film and I screened it at a bunch of festivals and up north and then there was a festival down here that I screened it at mm. so it had like been getting some traction amongst people who know who the Magonistas are mm -hmm. and my mom's other best friend, Sybil Vanegas, who's a curator who taught at ELAC for like decades, um, somehow got in touch with Pilar. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was it part of the Regeneración? Yeah. Oh, okay. I was trying to remember what, what show it was in. Okay. And Pilar got in touch with my mother, and my mother was like, well, I basically like, said you have a piece found <laughs> no no she had a piece okay in the show and then my mom was like i'm in this show and then i was like well can you get me in the show and then my mom's like oh i don't know yeah. like why don't you just contact them and i was like okay and then That's i just good. sent them an email and they were like okay and i was like okay <laughs> and then i flew down for the opening it all right like for young people really like sometimes it's just making that effort to com communicate with somebody and start the conversation yeah. of whatever it is you want to do. So your mom was right. Just contact them. <laughs> yeah. Have you done anything else with museums or anything like that? And that was like a documentary type short, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was in 2017, 2018. Um, yeah. I don't... Uh, I did want to ask you here that... um. Like it says that you s like to center your work around memory, family history, and the borderland experience. What is the borderland experience? I mean, I wrote that in 2017, mm -hmm. right after Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was reading Bell Hooks, Anzal Dua, mm -hmm. Fred Hampton, all that kind of like radical stuff that came out of the 60s and 70s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think there's this phrase that Anzal Dua talks a lot about, Nepantla, which is like you're in the middle. You're not really mm. on one side or the other. It's kind of the gray space. Mm. And I feel like my whole life I've never fit into categories. Like I'm Mexican-American. I'm fourth generation Californian, I'm not an immigrant, I'm not from East LA, I'm pocha, I'm Spanglish, <laughs> you know, like there's all these things about but me. But those are all groups too. <laughs> I guess, but like in white spaces, they want a kind of Latina who's yeah. like a first generation immigrant, yeah. like, because they want to feel good about themselves. Yeah, they can't yeah. fathom like we've been in this country for exactly. hundreds of years. Yeah. And it's like, sure, my, I'm an immigrant, if you mean like my great grandma, yeah. you know? <laughs> That's interesting. So you also did um, some work with, I think it was KCET or mm -hmm. where you did, um, you worked on the documentary City Rising. Yeah. Which I saw. Oh, you did? Yeah. That's, How'd you see it? I saw it at a screening at the... ¿Cómo se llama? El Sereno. No. Oh, Cal California Endow Endowment Center. Yeah. They were our funders. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I saw it at a big screen there with a lot of the people that were in it. I was actually, I shot the event. And. Um, oh, wait, I was there. I oh, got were you? you that gig. You didn't know that. Did you? Oh, okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I thought it was Rudy Espinosa, but. No. I don't remember. I gave, before I left, yeah. I gave them a whole, like, this is how I want the event. Yeah. I trust you to do it right. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that was an amazing documentary, like, series. And how was, that, how was that experience? And, um, how, like, what part did you play in that? So I was the producer. Okay. Of the entire thing? Yeah. Wow. So there was two directors slash cinematographers. There was one editor hmm. there was one um person who composed original music hmm. there was the executive direct 
director of KCAT, who was an executive director hmm. of the series. Then there were two executive producers who were my bosses, mm. and that was it. So I was the only bilingual person on that team. Wow. Um, there was one of the um, camera women slash directors. She's half Moroccan. Um, so she is a woman of, or I don't know how she identifies actually. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of responsibility to be the only <laughs> person who spoke Spanish when half of the people in that film were brown and Spanish speaking. Yeah. And I would come home after a film shoot just crying because there's a scene where we were in Santa Ana following Araceli. Can you explain a little bit the documentary and what it was? Sure. So City Rising, now there's three seasons. At the time, it was just one. Mm -hmm. And it's about the historical roots of modern day gentrification that we're seeing in Boyle Heights, East Oakland, East Long Beach, a neighborhood in Sacramento, and uh, South Central. Mm -hmm. Five cities. And um, the point was to explain to people that what we're seeing right now was not something that happened a year ago, two years ago. It was decisions that were decades in the making. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to peel back the layers because I don't know if you remember, but 2015, 2014 to 2019, gentrification was like a buzzword. Like you were either a good guy or a bad guy. Mm. Friendships were broken up over it. Nonprofits <laughs> were canceled Family. over mm. it. It was like hot drama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and we wanted to show that like, there's not one enemy here. There are policies in place since the 50s that yes. have laid the groundwork yep. for this. And I actually want to correct that. I would say it's policy since the founding of this country. Mm. I mean, we're on stolen land. Mm. And that part didn't make the film, but that sentiment was what we tried really hard to push on all of the editorial content we published mm. online. Mm. Wow. I think it, it was one of the like most comprehensive like pieces on gentrification that I had seen, you know, um, up until that point. And I had been following gentrification since I took a little journalism course at ELAC um, oh. on my second tour of East LA College. God, it had to be like, I can't remember the year, <laughs> but it was a while back. And I remember I wrote an article and the opening line was, Boy Heights is about to learn a new word. <laughs> <laughs> gentrification because wow. nobody knew that freaking word and and um except for the small handful of people that i had interviewed for that but um were yeah. they like academics or who knew no it was it? actually um i interviewed uh, nico from back oh. then he had Teo Sintli, which was his little store yeah. i interviewed him and javi moreno um who's an actor that's also his homeboy from back then but yeah it wasn't like you know it wasn't like everybody it wasn't like on shirts or anything right, like right. that it was just a very like not so much known word but um then i did i did something too with um marketplace which is also an npr show right oh yeah with I, cry yeah. grisdall cry Crystal. forgot their names but i did some photography for them where we photographed everybody in highland park that mm. was involved in gentrification from the people that they called like the end of the rainbow where like they had a house that their family owned for a lot of years and now they're being offered a million dollars so they'll sell it because they get oh, their like, pot of gold oh <laughs> they're like oh it's the pot of the gold syndrome like oh we've been waiting to sell our house for cash this. for keys kind of thing Ye not cash for keys but yeah i mean just people like, that are we'll like we'll give you cash for your keys of just your people house. that are ready to sell and because the market was you know high high they were just selling and moving to a bigger house in Riverside or whatever. Right. But I was also photographing the people that um, actually would come in and turn small little stores into, you know, from $800 a month to $3,000 mm -hmm. a month rentals. And the point is that the multifaceted, like, identity of gentrification is so hard 
Yeah. Like it's it is like something that is yeah. not just like a simple description. Right. And I think there's that meme of Charlie Day from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia mm-hmm. episode where he's trying to convince his friends of his conspiracy theory. <laughs> and he has all these like note cards on the wall with all these like yarn ribbons connecting the dots and he's like this like that was how the editor room was Mm. we were like what if we did the script this way and we would like scrap it every other week because we were like that's leaving this out that's leaving this out and um you know i'm very proud of what we made and i think I made I learned a lot of lessons from that. That was like my first IMBD credit actually. <laughs> and you got an Emmy for it. I did. Um Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and I think it made me really sensitive to the ways I guess my responsibility hmm. as a storyteller because hmm. as I was saying there's a scene in there where we're in Santa Ana following Araceli, who's a documented immigrant mom to three kids. Mm. She's the breadwinner in her family. Her husband does work, but she makes more money. She's a prometera, which she goes around door to door, Mm. advocating to her neighbors about free health services Mm. offered in their community. And her kids are proud um, I think they're called Santeros when you're from Santa Ana. Mm, that's funny. <laughs> and, you know, she loves Santa Ana and she's being evicted. Mm. And we met her kind of in that in between stage when they weren't sure if they were going to get evicted or if they had a legal case. And we followed her up until the day where she had to be out. Wow. And. Uh, there's a scene in there where she's putting all her belongings in trash bags and they still don't know where they're going to go and they're strategizing maybe we can sleep in the van tonight yeah. and I never felt so powerless mm. knowing that there was nothing I could do and You know, she ended up okay a week later. She was able to rent an apartment in Anaheim or Garden Grove. But she had to sleep in a bunk bed with her husband and her two kids had to sleep on the bottom bunk bed. Yeah. And she did that so that her kids could go to the same school in Santa Ana, Hmm. even though it meant spending a lot of rent in Garden Grove or Anaheim, I can't remember. Mm. And I think when I finished that project, I I didn't want anything to do with a camera Mm. because I felt extractive, even though I didn't, even though Araceli was a willing participant, she knew her rights. She volunteered to be in the film because she wanted people to understand her plight and other people in her shoes and she had agency in the film and we asked her like how do you want us to portray you do you want us to film you cooking walking your kid to school like it's Mm -hmm. up to you Mm -hmm. but I just felt so like who am I to win an Emmy when someone's Mm -hmm. displaced Mm -hmm. and I would have friends once I got to the Bay who were like entrepreneurs and business people and they would be like, can you shoot me a promo? And I was like, I asked someone else, like, I don't want anything to do with the camera. Wow. Like I, I almost sold my camera Yeah. because I just felt so confused. I, I can understand what you're saying, definitely, but also... Like, who else would tell these stories? Do you know what I mean? So, I, but I can see that because I mean, I, you know, I, I shoot people in the street. So, I, I call it like, <laughs> well, this is, this is TMI, but when I was young, my nickname was Klepto, you know, because I used to steal a lot of stuff. Uh. So, 
like sometimes I feel that way with the camera. It's like I'm stealing something, you know, stealing something from the street. So there are times where I have a picture where I'm like, no, that's like, I don't need to share that picture or show it because it's it's like too personal or too private for whatever that person was. And and but but I mean, not to the extent where you're that you experience. And that's tough to feel that that moment of helplessness. And you have to keep the camera rolling, you know? Yeah. And you have to, yeah. you know, bring it back and edit it and put it together and knowing that they're out in the street somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's... But at the same time, like, if you didn't do this... Right. You know? I mean, I think that was a really important film when I saw it. I was blown away by it. And then you said they did more a couple more epis- more seasons? Yeah, the second season's about, I think, what they call the underground economy. So, yeah, like, street I vendors. That. I did see that, yeah. The third season, they filmed it in the pandemic, so they had to stop shooting halfway. Oh, okay. But it was all about youth activism. So okay. anything from, like, Me Too to climate change to, like, anti-policing in the schools. Oh, okay, I don't think I saw that one. But I did see the, the economy one, the underground economy. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I mean, it's important work, you know, and uh, but I, I can see where you're coming from with that. Yeah. The guilt. Yeah. Right? It's guilt. Kind of like a survivor's guilt. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But the problem is, at the time, I didn't have those tools or that language to name yeah. what I was feeling. I was just told by my peers, like, oh, like, just, like, go do something nice for yourself. Or, like, donate to a cause you care about. And I was like, but I already do that. Yeah. Like, that doesn't change the fact that I lay awake at night being like, I'm guilty. And also, I mean, you were really young. Yeah. I was really young. So what I'm trying to, like, find here is a way to tell you that you should continue to do the work because it's important and it's good work. (laughs) So... If you can find a way to pick up that camera, or I don't know if you did put it down, but if you, you know, get inspired, I hope that I hope that you do produce some more stuff. You know, yeah, it's a tough one, but yeah. I mean, I I never sold my camera. I just kind of changed tools. I picked up a mic and mm. an audio recorder, but I I I miss I miss cameras. Mm. Like I'm an avid media cinebuff, cinephile. <laughs> <laughs> cinephile, like or movie buff. Yeah, I love movies. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit of movies then. You did graduate with a uh, film mm-hmm. degree, right? So, what kind of movies are you into, or what would you like? Ooh. <laughs> I would love to do a rom-com mm. Now when you say rom-com Like what Like subgenre I guess Like something oh, like Oh okay If you want to get really <laughs> niche There's a genre of rom-coms By indie filmmakers Where the couple doesn't end up together Yeah, yeah. It's a breakup movie yeah, yeah. I fucking love breakup movies <sighs> I'm trying to remember the name of one something child. God, I can't remember. It was it was Oh, Obvious Child. Obvious Child, yes. Yes, with Jenny Slate. Beautiful. I love Jenny Slate. Yeah, directed, written. Yes. Lead all women. Yes. Beautiful movie. Hilarious. Yeah. And that same little feeling of like, mm, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it didn't work out like a Hollywood right. quote unquote film, but beautiful films, yeah. I I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I want to make. Do you also write stuff like that, or um, would you have? Would you want someone else to write it, or do you think you can also? Pull yeah, it out? I would want. So I would want to be the Issa Rae or the Quinta B, or the Jabuki Young White for LA. Yeah. Well, Issa Rae is from LA. Okay, I want to be that for San Gabriel Valley. Yeah. Where she has a team. Yeah. And she's like. This is what I want it about. I can ad lib. I can do dialogue, but you need to write the character arc, the story arc. Yeah. 
have you ever thought of just producing your own little self-produced series? I'm bad at asking for help. Yeah, me too. So, like, <laughs> who would I have to act? Yeah. Or, like, hold the camera? And I know that there's 100 people out there going, me! <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way, because I've written some stuff that I have yet to put together and mm. actually shoot. But, um, yeah, I'm really bad at asking for help, like, without paying people. Yeah. And that's what, like, hurts me. It's like, I don't want to just... I want to be able to pay people somehow <laughs> or right. at least feed them really well, you know? Yeah. But maybe someday. Yeah. Same. Still working on that. Yeah. Right. So you want to direct or just produce? I want to direct. Yeah. I think in order to be a director, you have to be a producer. Hmm. Same with in order to be an editor, you have to be a producer is uh, what hmm. I believe to be true. Hmm. And I feel why, like... Why is that the editor producer one because you need to be able to ha understand what your work team does hmm. i think a bad leader is someone who doesn't understand the value of their employees or team hmm. and i feel like there's a lot of directors out there who like want to be an artiste or a what do you call it what is um what's his name who makes those little auteur. cute films? Auteur. Yeah. Everybody wants to be an auteur. Wes Anderson. Yeah. Mm. Well, you can only be an auteur if you actually understand, like, how a movie gets made from start to finish. Yeah. From, like, redrafts to scripting to casting to costume design to paying people to feeding people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you need to be able to run the entire boat. Right. Yeah, not just hold the steering wheel on it. Exactly. Or you need to know how it all works. Yeah. At least, yeah. Like, that was the best advice. Okay, I was a PA on something, and I I was like, just put me in any department. Like, I don't care. Mm -hmm. And they put me in costume. Mm -hmm. No, they put me in props. Mm -hmm. And it was like this guy who was so cool, and the best advice he gave me was like, just like... If you want to make it in this industry, you need to be flexible. Like, you can't go in thinking you want to do one thing because you're never going to get there. You need to be open to doing everything. And who knows, maybe the thing you thought you wanted to do won't be what you want to do. Mm -hmm. He's like, I didn't go in this biz being like, I want to work with props. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's like the go-to man for props for nice. everyone, like The Rock. Any big actor like calls him because nice. he gets shit done. Nice. We're running close to the near end here, and I want to ask you if there's a way for people to look you up. Um, do you want to give out your Instagram websites? You can catch me on Yelp <laughs> and Venmo. <laughs> what is my Venmo? Okay, sorry. My Twitter dot com is at M A R I S O L reports at Marisol reports. Yeah. Cool. All right. Do you want to give away your Instagram or no? All right. Nah. So find her on Twitter and um, keep up with your work in the Bay Area. Are you gonna come back to LA? Do you think so? You don't like, know. You so. mean like to hang out or to live? To live. live. Oh, that's a loaded question. Yeah. I don't know who wants to hire me here. Yeah. So I mean. Ooh. Would you like to come back to LA? Yes. Yeah. I want to be the Issa Rae well, of Pasadena. Put it out there. Put it out there in the universe. And <laughs> hopefully you'll get to come back and produce some shows. Yeah. Um, we have a final question that we ask every guest here. And it's okay. a very simple question. Try to answer it in one okay. sentence. Can it be a run-on sentence? Sure. <laughs> Marisol, how do you do it? Can I improv? Like, <laughs> like, can I? Just answer okay. whatever comes to your mind. I'm going to ask you again. Okay. All right, ready? Marisol, how do you do it? I wake up in the morning, and I look at my phone, and I take in the news, and I say, what is this bullshit? And then I, like, cry to myself, and then I make <laughs> jokes about it, and then I put on my granny panties, and I go report about it. That's beautiful. That's probably the... <laughs> <laughs> Issa Rae is looking at this like, you should have stopped. 
Well, that was your Easter egg moment in the mirror, right? Yeah, you know how she's yeah. like, hold down, hold down. You're going to get the hold down. You know that <laughs> episode? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. And thanks for the laughs. And um, yeah, we'll see you next week. <laughs>